a lot of the people in the impact economy or in the sector that, that we work with uh, realize the gravity of the situation and realize that we could not afford to be uh, to say, okay, let's take this one off and sit and do nothing now and wait until things go back to normal. We realize that uh, it's time to actually have a different normal, not normal and, and build a different, uh, build back better if you, if you hear in many environments of, of how we think and how we bring innovation at scale and speed. And I think, um, so again, from my side, uh, it has been an extremely positive experience of mobilizing like-minded people that are feeling that the time is right and that the needs are more evident. And sadly, some uh, of the gains, especially if we're gonna talk about absolute poverty, uh, we are seeing some, some negative numbers. So we cannot be uh, too late in reacting. Dr. Professor Vanina Farber and Dr. Peter Wolfley are my guests on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Vanina is an econ economist and political scientist with 20 years of teaching, research, and consultancy experience. She holds the Ella Chair for Social Innovation at IMD. Previously, Vanina was Dean of the Graduate School of Business and Associate Professor at Universidad del Pacifico in Peru. Peter is a doctor and senior leader and entrepreneurial philanthropist. He is the founder and chairman of Ella Foundation for Ethics and Globalization and the honorary chairman of IMD. Previously, Peter was a partner at McKinsey and Company, the CEO of UBS Group, the chairman of Partners Group, and of IMD. In 2015, he published the book, Inclusive Leadership, and um, he also started the foundation uh, with his wife uh, in, I believe it was around 2006. And uh, so it, it started out as a nice uh, type of a family effort. Uh, and the foundation has done wonderful things here today. We have actually four different um, aspects in the room today. So besides the, my two wonderful guests, we're also going to be talking about the book, The Ella Way. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about that. Um, Social entrepreneurship and impact investing contribute to a more inclusive capitalism and bring innovative solutions to global challenges such as fighting poverty and protecting planet Earth. This book offers practical advice on how to best integrate entrepreneurship and capital for impact and innovation by using Ella's philanthropic investing approach to fight absolute poverty with entrepreneurial means as an example. Written by these two wonderful leading experts, the book summarizes insights from Ella's 15 year pioneering journey from creating an investment organization, choosing purposeful themes and sourcing opportunities to, part uh, to partnering with entrepreneurs for impact creation. This inclusive suggestions on how to lead impact enterprises in such areas as developing strategies, plans, and models, building effective teams and organizations, managing resources, and handling crisis. Using real life examples in this valuable reading for entrepreneurs, investors, executives, philanthropists, policymakers, and anyone curious about entrepreneurship and inclusive capitalism. Now with our last guest or mention on the show is the Institute for Management and Development, which we will call from now on IMD, is an independent academic institution with Swiss roots and global research founded almost 75 years ago by business leaders for business leaders. Since its creation, IMD has been a pioneering force in developing leaders who transform 
organizations and contribute to society. That was a mouthful, and I thank everyone <laughs> for making it this far. I promise we have an exciting uh, show for us. Please welcome my guests. It's so good to have you both here today. Uh, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for the invitation and the kind words of introduction, too. Yeah. It's yes, my, my pleasure. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. It's so wonderful to have you both on the show and to, I really want to get into a deep dive discussion about the book, about what you guys have been doing for a while. Um, but first and foremost, I need to ask both of you the question and I'll let you fight out over who goes first, but maybe we could, we could give uh, uh, the, the wonderful professor in the room first the, the answer. And that is, with all this experience, all this work that you guys have done research and, and in this area of uh, impact investing about working with social entrepreneurs and being in these topics of uh, inclusive leadership and, and things over all these years, being at a university and academic level, has that provided you with any form of sustainability, any form of resilience to weather this crazy time we've all had during the pandemic and how have you weathered all this time up until this point? Good. So I think um, at least uh, from my personal side, and I think we have seen the inequality of responses in, in this pandemic. I think uh, from a very privileged side, I, I found several silver linings if you want in this in this pandemic and one is uh, i think there has been a change in mindset we we realize in a certain way that uh, systemic risk can become very real you no know, certain things in the past when we talk about climate change or even if we talk about poverty in general seem too abstract and when we were talking about a pandemic or a virus seemed like a very small risk or something that was systemic but we knew could happen but it didn't seem real. And I think now we're living the consequences and the massive destruction of values. So I think in a certain point, the pandemic brought this different perception of how something that sounds or seems very improbable or, or small probability in the tale we say in, when we talk about risk can actually destroy value. And in the other, I think from, from another perspective, probably Peter will be able to address even this side more as I think when you work in, in social impact or you make a decision in the impact economy, we always talked about being forward looking and about special impact investment patient capital, you know, not to look at the profits tomorrow or today or the short span. And I think a lot of the answers right now need to be patient you know, and also need to look beyond the crisis on how how we can build impact into the decision making. So I think those two things uh, even though we live in today, uh, the idea of before we're looking, I think is something important or has helped me uh, to, to stay relatively sane, again, from a very privileged situation in Switzerland and, and with a job at a university. You know? Be before we hear from Peter, I want to poke a little bit further and get some, uh, a couple more things from you. So were you, can, did you continue this year to, uh, to teach and offer programs and courses? And also, um, you, you released the book in February, so there's been some things about promotion around the book, but uh, about the, the formulas and the methods and the models and the way of thinking in the book. Have um, any of those things that are discussed in there or during this time, you've seen some aha moments because you've been doing it, you've been addressing it for a while that those came to bubble to the surface or you said, well, we were well prepared because we were kind of speaking about these things and, and talking about, you know, uh, poverty and issues and, and crisis. There's a section in the book that talks about crisis and crisis management as well. And, and so did that give you any good positive stories or preparedness or, or how, how did you handle those things as well? I think, uh, again, as a professor and, and, um, and IMD is a relatively small institution and very entrepreneurial. We said we, 
we we don't get worried we get busy you know so i think uh, this is something that push our creativity to deliver content and to be near in a different way and i've been teaching online for the last 12 years so even before i came to imd so i'm very comfortable with the environment so i think i got very busy i started doing webinars we work closely with peter I believe that it was the time since a lot of people were captive at home to try to build a community around the LEA Center for Social Innovation. And I tried to activate a, a, a lot of my, what I would say, move my, my social capital, move the people that I know to actually be also active. You know? And I think a, a lot of the people in the impact economy or in the sector that, that we work with uh, realize the gravity of the situation and realize that we could not afford to be uh, to say okay let's take this one off and sit and do nothing no, and wait until things go back to normal we realize that uh, it's time to actually have a different normal not normal and, and build a different uh, build back better if you if you hear in many environments of of how we think and how we bring innovation at scale and speed and I think um, so again, from my side, uh, it has been an extremely positive experience of mobilizing like-minded people that are feeling that the time is right and that the needs are more evident. And sadly, some uh, of the gains, especially if we're gonna talk about absolute poverty, uh, we are seeing some, some negative numbers. So we cannot be uh, too late in reacting. Thank you very much, Peter. Well, there are very different feelings and very ambivalent reactions uh, to this crisis. On one hand, obviously, uh, having the privilege to live in Switzerland, uh, one just can't uh, get away being uh, feeling incredibly grateful uh, for uh, living in a country with a functioning democracy, with a responsible government, with a good healthcare system, with strong institutions, where things are debated, where science is considered, uh, and obviously comparing that to how some other countries in the Western as well as in the emerging world have been dealing with it uh, creates a, a sense of gratitude. At the same time, it's sadness uh, of how much progress has been essentially undone, uh, often not because of the virus, but because of the reactions to the virus. Uh, pushing hundreds of people into poverty, uh, hundreds of millions of, of people back into poverty after having reached a lot of progress uh, in recent years uh, with people uh, improving their livelihoods. And I guess finally, uh, from our perspective, uh, dealing on a daily basis with entrepreneurs in these countries, it was just uh, incredibly humbling to see uh, how they uh, kind of, uh, on one hand, fought for survival, showed an enormous amount of resilience under much more difficult conditions uh, in their countries with uh, unpredictable government measures, with difficult logistics, with uh, uh, not as well elaborated IT infrastructure. Uh, and they still succeeded in basically moving people to home office and having to close their activities, uh, having to reduce at the already low level their incomes. Uh, and. Uh, at the same time, grasping opportunities. I mean, we have some of our investments are in the field of uh, informal retail last mile distribution. For example, one of our investments, Dharma Life in India, reaches uh, 13 million people uh, in rural India, and they were able to reach out to them and give them trusted information on hygiene, on uh, how to uh, cope with uh, protecting each other against the virus. Uh, and I think that was very humbling and in a way confirmed one of the basic beliefs in our book. By the way, the book appeared in November, uh, in, not in February. Okay. Uh, so it, it was very recently published, uh, and, uh, and, and it, 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 it proved that uh, impact results from entrepreneurship. I mean, entrepreneurial people, entrepreneurial attitudes, entrepreneurial capabilities, uh, they lead to sustainable change. That's one of our key beliefs. And on a very personal note, I must say, uh, COVID for me helped me to get the concentration uh, in uh, summer to actually wrote, write the book uh, because uh, a lot of the agenda was changed. We could no longer travel. And for book writing, uh, home office is actually a good thing. That's wonderful. So I'm also dealing with that. I'm getting ready to release my book, Menu B, People on Planet, Food Saving Solutions. And uh, I know that I was fortunate enough uh, to let the listeners know um, 
to receive an advance copy uh, on that and and the date on there was that so I, I i assume that was the original publishing date but there are some timely things about uh, covid and and things that that uh, you can tell that the that there was some some aspects of that as well so uh i want to ask you another question peter and it's kind of a little bit more towards your background and what even got you to the point of, of not only starting the foundation uh, and um, from going from UBS hedge fund, was it some of those maybe negative experiences and, and also with, a, I, I don't know if IMD um, ethics uh, work that you did was prior or during UBS or, or if it was after and how that kind of bubbled to the surface for you to even transition more in this direction, which, which is probably, in my opinion, a little bit different than this UBS hedge fund and, and the departure of UBS. Well, I was uh, chief executive of UBS group, uh, not of uh, UBS hedge fund, but uh, of UBS group uh, until the middle of 2007 and we created a layout foundation at the end of 2006 uh, so before I left and I think there were three elements that drove me uh, to essentially launch uh, a layout foundation one was that I always felt that globalization is the mega trend of our generation uh, and that globalization overall has a lot of net positives provides enormous opportunities to hundreds of million of people to step out of poverty, but at the same time has losers, uh, has lots of people that do not have access to globalization opportunities. And being born in Switzerland and having had the privilege to uh, have the career that I had, uh, you, you just have, can't help uh, than to feel some level of solidarity with all those that did not have that access. And so that's one part. The other part is a very personal one. I, uh, when I was a student, I'm an economist. I, I developed a passion for poverty economics. Uh, I always felt it should be the noble purpose of, a, of an economist to understand why poverty exists and what can be done about it. And so uh, I was incredibly thrilled uh, when uh, a year ago, two po uh, empirical poverty economists got the Nobel Prize for the first time, actually. Uh, and so it was very much a, a deep passion of mine that goes back to my days as a student. And the third had to do with life planning. I, I made, as you uh, indicated, a, quite a rapid career. I became chief executive of a large global uh, multinational company at 44 years uh, old. And, and uh, there was always the question, what do I do after? Uh, because uh, CEOs of large companies last for five to seven years. And if we take good care of our mind and of our body, we make it to 90 plus, uh, hopefully. And so it had also to do with how do I want to spend not only my financial means, but also my life energy. And these were the three elements that led to uh, creating ELEA as a uh, organization with a purpose to fight absolute poverty with entrepreneurial means. Absolute poverty means $3 and less daily income. And entrepreneurial means uh, means essentially investing in companies, not investing in development projects or in public policy initiatives, but investing in entrepreneurially led companies, because we have found uh, over way that this is the best way uh, to create sustainable impact because entrepreneurs typically don't think in a time horizon of 12 to 18 months. They think in a time horizon of their own lifetime and possibly beyond. Uh, and so there's a completely different kind of sustainability level if you invest in entrepreneurs and in companies as opposed to uh, typical development projects. I love that. Thank you both for giving us that update and the insight. Uh, you are both very fortunate to, to be in Switzerland. I, I, I must say, though, uh, this the beginning of this year, I was there for Davos, obviously, and um, the World Economic Forum's annual meeting. And it, it was amazing. The year started out with a bang, and then we were really thrust into the craziest year I, I probably ex experienced in my lifetime. Uh, Hopefully. And, <laughs> yeah, and let, let's. I think there's more to come. I don't think it. Uh, we need to build in some resilience and some more different steps to to prepare better for for the next crises of our future. Um, Paul Pullman, who's also uh, very active at, at the forum, uh, and he gave you guys a wonderful write up in the book, a little accolade, and 
Ella's innovative approach reinforces convergence across corporations, investment organizations, and entrepreneurs towards social impact and meaningful purpose. Its lessons are valuable for corporate executives as they realize strategies that benefit societies. Um, not only is Paul a wonderful person, but I just uh, had his wife, Kim, on, on the podcast um, last week, and, and uh, that episode will launch uh, sometime in January. But uh, we're talking about, you know, what's, what's the future of the World Economic Forum? Where are the meetings? Are they going to be in Lucerne and Bergenstock? Now it's official that it's going to be held in May in Singapore. Singapore. And that is because Switzerland is having some issues with, with the, the crisis and the COVID and things like that. And that, uh, I promise you, this ties into the next question, but that has to do with this globalization, right? Right? Um, when, when we don't find livability or the structures, the infrastructures or the health in the places where we're at or we do business, in order to continue those businesses, those foundations and that, we start to look around the world. And a lot of the examples in your book as well as fighting poverty and things are in other places outside of Switzerland where you're supporting entrepreneurs and wonderful projects. So that leads me to the, this, this question, how do you feel uh, or consider maybe yourself as a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, divisions of humanity one from another? I can start if you want, Please. and we had just uh, uh, John Lennon's <laughs> uh, third imagine, year. Big yeah. Imagine, no? Yeah. Uh, I was born uh, in Argentina, uh, and I've been living outside of Argentina in the last almost 30 years, uh, and I've been very privileged to have open doors in every country that I live. I live in the U.S., I lived in Spain, uh, and now in Switzerland, uh, but I know that that it's a privilege. My mom was actually a refugee from World War II that came to, to Latin America. So um, I, I have that, uh, I would say, dream of uh, being able to to share the wealth if you want and to, uh, to become a global citizen. But I also understand that that reality, uh, it's, uh, it's for people like me with a relative pri privilege. You know? So I do think we, and I work from the LEA Center for Social Innovation now in a coalition uh, with the Red Cross, with uh, the WEF is part of this and other main players on how you address the refugee issue. So I, I, I do believe in the movement and the free movement of people, uh, but I also understand that there are a lot of regulatory and that there are a lot of things that you need to add that it's not as simple as say, okay, let's open the borders and let everybody move in a way that probably my experience has been. So I think the, the, the issue, especially in times where uh, we are questioning certain things on globalization and we're trying to become more local and protect each other from the borders. Uh, I think it is, again, an important issue, but it's not as simple as saying, okay, let's just move around uh, freely uh, in economics many times. That they, and that was the, the dream of the EU, for example, that was a pro, an idea that I support and I still support uh, uh, strongly. So, but we know that in practice, as if you look at the EU, how challenging it is, you know. So for me, in a certain way, the way of working on, on impact and as we do on impact investment and on education is a way to find my own niche without borders, if you want, in the, in, in the education piece of the story. Yeah. The reason and I really I have, want... Yeah. I have, a similar, I have a similar kind of openness in my genes. I mean, my granddad was a very poor fellow, uh, grew up during World War I and basically uh, had the possibility to become an apprenticeship in, in metal working. And he basically took one of the first ships 
that went to the US in 1919 uh, and uh, stayed in the US and learned a new technology that he then brought back uh, and uh, essentially could develop in a, in a small Swiss industrial company. And he was the one in our family who made the biggest jump because he came from a very poor background to basically becoming a manager of that company. Uh, and, uh, and I myself as well. I mean, I was an amateur radio ham uh, when I was a young guy and I was in contact with the whole world. Uh, and I was in Mexico uh, doing my PhD. I lived three years in the US, uh, two years in Chicago, one year in New York. Uh, I obviously, since uh, we've we done the foundation, I've visited almost every country in, in Africa and in South Asia and in Latin America. Uh, and I must say one of the things that worries me most right now are all these strong forces to put up borders. Uh, and even in Switzerland, uh, where more than half of our GDP comes from uh, essentially serving the world, uh, we have very strong nationalist tendencies. And uh, I must say that's also besides the very tangible uh, purpose uh, to fight uh, poverty, uh, it's also to create awareness for how beneficial globalization is. And so, yes, of course, uh, I would wish that we can build bridges and not build walls and that we uh, tear down all these uh, kind of uh, nationalist movements that we that we have right now by essentially caring for each other uh, and also finding ways to collaborate across sectors. I mean, uh, Juanina has mentioned the uh, ICRC, the Red Cross. Uh, Peter Maurer, as you may have noticed, has, has written another very nice comment. Uh, it's a good friend of mine, uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, yeah, quite debates uh, how important it is that, uh, for example, humanitarian, humanitarian organizations work together uh, with governments and private sector companies uh, to improve livelihoods. And so all what can help collaboration, I think, will reduce risks of in instability, poverty, and, and ultimately war. I really uh, appreciate that and, and your insight. I, I want to tie it even more a little bit. So during the pandemic, as a prime example, humanity is, uh, for the most part, now going into second and third lockdowns and discussions, uh, depending on where you live in. Um, and, and because of some of those lockdowns now, uh, events are totally moving online and, and uh, the WEF making the move to, to move it to Singapore and have it a, be a blended on and offline type of a, a format as, is pretty telling. But during the pandemic as well, those things that weren't locked into nations and borders were food, air, water, uh, species, you know, pan the pandemic. Um, and uh, of course, we're all global citizens or part of this globalization model, so to say, that uh, still move around the world. I had on my show, Dr. Parag Kanan, uh, and he uh, speaks a lot about geospatial data and the true maps of our world where we have the satellite data of supply chain movement or, or, or satellite data of our globe uh, lights at night and, and different things on where humanity lives and how they move around the world and how goods and services move around the world that show us a really different map of the world of the probably the true way that, that things work and function. And so because you, you do address that as part of the things, not only in the book, but in, in the foundation and other things and works that you've done, I'd like to almost see if you could tickle the surface some more and give us some more insights on why that's important, why you discuss that topic and, and how it's progressing. Has this pandemic bubbled some things to the surface, shined the microscope uh, un under things and, and made it Said we've got some some problems in our system, and maybe we should think about some bigger models like this. Can you give us more insight on that? Yeah, I think if I look at our portfolio of investments, I mean, one of the real positives is the easiness for communication uh, with the locations where our investments are, and that are countries like uh, Kenya, like South Africa, like Bolivia. Uh, like Peru, uh, like India, like the Philippines. And I must say what for me was the biggest positive surprise is how smoothly that worked. 
uh, and how we had, uh, with many of our entrepreneurs being in crisis mode, we were in, in touch uh, almost on a daily basis. I mean, we could uh, essentially do restructurings of companies uh, in remote mode, uh, which five years ago I would have said is impossible across uh, these long distances and also along these uh, across these cultural distances. And so I think there is reason to be optimistic uh, that this forced application of communication technology helps to tear down barriers and ease communication and make it more natural to basically hop on a call uh, and debate things. Uh, and, and very tangibly, all our investments that are in the employable skill building area, I mean, they were forced to essentially leapfrog a period of three to five years of distance learning. I mean, they were forced to, to, to go online in their learning modules within a few weeks. Uh, and so I think that has achieved a lot of progress, which I would consider a good thing. Uh, so I think I'm not in the camp of people who say, well, globalization is dead because A, pandemic and B, uh, nationalist movements. I think globalization has found some limits. Uh, I think one limit obviously is the exaggerated business travel. Uh, and, and I meet many colleagues of mine who look very fresh, very healthy, very <laughs> happy, not having to deal with all these jet lags. <laughs> Myself. And, and leading a much healthier life, uh, spending more time on sports than in planes. Uh, and, uh, and so I do think it has positives and people will recalibrate a little bit. They will also recalibrate these highly sophisticated and optimized value chains. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, transporting mineral water across uh, the globe is just not very sensible uh, in a world where our planet is uh, threatened. So I think buying local, having more simple value chains, uh, not being dependent on faraway places that you're not really familiar with. So I see a lot of positives uh, that come and that will essentially uh, uh, address some exaggerations of globalization, but also uh, make more meaningful connections through technology. Yeah. On my side, uh, and a little bit on the, on the same line, uh, is uh, I work a lot also on what we call ESG integration in the financial sector, environmental, social, and governance. And every time that you talk about this, it used to be environmental or governance. And the S was a little more flu. Uh, and I think that's something that pop up to, to the center now with, with, uh, with COVID. And, and also how those companies that had labor relations, that had inequality, that had asked part of their dealing was part of their culture actually performed better and had more resilient value chains and had uh, and those that protected health of the workers in the value chain also did better than companies that did not care no so i think uh, again from a from a positive side uh, realizing that that the S that the social indicators are sometimes are a lot harder to measure you know, because when we talk again about in the book we talk about impact investing investing needs intentionality but also measurement of impact it, it might be a little harder now uh, is showing that there are ways to 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 measure to connect and actually to consciously make a decision to improve them and this is what I think uh, is interesting for me uh, is that we we think about the, the, the downside of globalization, we need to include this idea of fighting inequality, of, of including inclusiveness. And I think Peter has also inclusive leadership in the book uh, as a key word that comes with the business models in order to, to have this positive view that we are talking about. You know, without fighting inequality and without fighting, without in, inclusive, even for technologies, thinking about inclusive technologies, it's a key piece of how you look at business models these days. You know? I definitely see that the, the big part of the investments is in the social capital, the human capital, so to say, and also throughout the book, uh, it also discusses, you know, how you develop people, how you can help them and give them the tools and the empowerment and the models. But it also uh, starts out really with some wonderful examples and Gaza, uh, Bagosphere, uh, Coffee Circle, the Dharma Life as, as well, um, that are uh, social entrepreneurship uh, um, and a, a lot of smallhold farmers and um, the small medium enterprises in developing countries to empower them, enable them with uh, some, some 
tools and uh, monies and ways to really make a huge impact. And, and that is so vital to see that part. But I want to go even deeper in something that you've touched upon, uh, Anina, and, and that is this ESG. One fabulous thing, and I'm sure you've seen it as well, and I'd like to get your thoughts or feelings on this, is during a pandemic, during a crisis like this, that has uh, really has grown exponentially, um, there's, you know, uh, and as an economist, Peter, there's a lot of things that they say, oh my gosh, are we ever going to recover? This is an economic uh, tragedy. Um, that those companies that had divested or invested in environmental social governance into their business models and made investments in that direction in the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and now the fourth quarter have all outperformed their conventional counterparts. And we're not talking just by a little bit, we're talking eight to nine out of 10 uh, to their con conventional counterparts. And even during the holiday season where some forms of, of purchases would, would shift to, to non-ESG products or companies, um, we're still seeing that, but also in the Morning Star Review, 25 out of 28, uh, is, I believe the last number in the third quarter we saw, are outperforming their conventional counterparts. And it's not just a few, it's Nikkei, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, Goldman and Sachs, it's, it's um, the S&B 500, S&B Global, uh, um, um, that are saying, wow, this is a better business model. And here's the proof. The proof's in the, what we're seeing in these, these quarters and in the investments and the returns that you would say, how in the heck are these companies climbing and receiving investments and funds and, and growing during this time where the rest of us are struggling? And with that, just one more caveat before I have you guys answer this question is that those companies who did that are actually seeing, or those organizations that have made that shift are seeing that they've, they've got this resilience that we talked about at the beginning, that now they were able to pivot and de de uh, deliver vital digital technologies or services, food, uh, or pivot on a dime to create respirators or vaccine help or, or whatever it is during this time to help others who weren't prepared. And uh, in that showed that that's a better, more resilient model. And so I'd like to see, uh, I know you guys are, are very politically correct and you don't want to point the fingers, ha ha, we've told you, we've been talking about this model for years and that this is the better way. Uh, it's always about, you know, is there a return? Is that truly profitable? Can, can we do that? Why do we want to be more sustainable? And so I'd like to hear, not only stories, but also what you guys have seen during this time in, in, in those areas from both of you. And please, I'll leave it up to you who would like to go first. I can yeah. go first a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, I, I'm doing some research and uh, on this, but there are nuances. If this is not a foolproof that you go into sustainability or an ESG and you're going to perform better. So even though I'm a believer and I work on this and from IMD, we work with companies in these transformations, uh, it's not as simple as, as that. When many times when, even if you look at some of the results, in many cases, some of these industries, the technological companies are were part of the ESG and were driving some of the higher returns or the low oil prices in the first two quarters. Still, this resilience is proven and there is more and more research showing that those that include ESG on material issues overperform. And why do I go to this idea? The idea of materiality shows that it's not that you just include anything, it, you include the core topics and sustainability that are tied to your business. And I think this is something that, that in the book we talked a lot, or I think Peter at the Lea methodology looks a lot when they do the, their investing, the investment is that the impact is really the core of the business. So when the business actually grows and scale up, impact scales up. So when we talked about uh, transforming these business models, we're not talking about doing projectitis and doing a lot of things on ESG, but really transforming the way that companies uh, produce, that companies package their processes, their product, even their business models. So again, I would 
there's still a lot of research being done about uh, precisely proving this resilience, but I think, uh, and, and you see the move, and I think this is why you're seeing the financial sector moving so fast, because the, the research and the results are piling up that uh, we're starting to have that business case. But obviously, depending on the asset manager, depending on the investor, the results can be more, more nuanced. It's not a blank check. Well, before, uh, and, it's, and it's a hard transformation to do. Before Peter answers, I just want to say something to that. that the, the positive thing at the beginning of the year at the World Economic Forum this year was that uh, um, BlackRock also came out and said, you know, if we don't make this shift to ESG and that our portfolios don't include that, that there's going to be some, I don't know if punishment's the right word, but there's going to be some fines or consequences of that. And um, so those, that shift I've been seeing more and more over the years, and I just love to see that the right people are on board and more and more understanding that. But Peter, um, please let us know your thoughts. Yes, I think from a, from a practical perspective, we have seen tremendous momentum in the recent, I would say, two, three, four years in that direction. I think before, quite frankly, when we started the layout 15 years ago, it was a little bit of a niche activity. Uh, people did not really know what impact investing is. Uh, also, ESG was kind of, to some extent, uh, more part of the PR departments and of the public affair uh, responsibles. And what we have seen in recent years is that it has really become mainstream and it has reached uh, the chief executive level. And I guess data points for me are, one, uh, we just recently had the CEO roundtable that we regularly do at IMD every year with about 60, 70 CEOs uh, across the globe from different industry. And this was the number one topic. I mean, how do we ensure we have a purpose that goes beyond profitability. Obviously, it includes profitability because if we're not profitable, we cannot survive. We cannot reinvest. We will not attract capital. But beyond profitability, we need to demonstrate a purpose uh, that uh, goes uh, and that demonstrates benefits to society. And this is driven by three major elements. One is clients. I mean, customers want ethical products. They, they will not buy products that involve child labor. They will not buy products that are damaging to the, to the, to the planet. Uh, it's driven by investors, as Vanina has said. I mean, there is a, a, an explosion of indices on sustainability uh, of uh, asset managers and investment professionals now really asking the right questions. And most important of all, it's talent. Young people, uh, they want to work for a company where uh, it's clear what the, their meaningful purpose is. And we have, at ELEA, we have started two years ago with an uh, ELEA talent program for young people, uh, bachelor, master, kind of mid 20s kind of guys, uh, very talented. We got 182 applications for two jobs. So it's unbelievable and, wow. and absolutely terrific uh, curriculums. People who would otherwise apply with Accenture, with McKinsey, with UBS, with the big, with the big brands. And so we really see a, a, a change. Uh, and I think that is encouraging. I think that shows that the message that societies have been sending to business since probably eight to 10 years that the so business has to serve society and not the other way around. I think this has been listened to and has been heard. And so now I think it's about taking the right actions, also managing expectations. I mean, Absolutely. things take time. Uh, just putting money at problems doesn't help. And I think that's one of the key messages of the book. Uh, that uh, you need both. You need entrepreneurial capacity, capability, skills, mindsets in order to make good use of resources. Uh, and that means that investment organizations need to appreciate what entrepreneurs can do and entrepreneurs need to be in a position to make good use of capital. And that's essentially what our formula for inclusive capital is, is about. Uh, entrepreneurship times capital equals profit plus impact. Uh, that, that's the essence of what we want to uh, show in the book. There's a big section in the book, uh, uh, you know, it pops up uh, in the beginning as well, but also around chapter five, uh, uh, really talking about ethics and really uh, liberal ethic concepts and, and importance of that, which is, is vital, is uh, their specific reason uh, besides IMD or uh, the center that you decided to really focus in on ethics or what, what's, the, what's the movement uh, in general that it was focused on? 
as much. I must, I must say that's a bit of a hobby of mine since 40 years. Uh, I actually wanted to do my PhD uh, on ethics, and then I decided to do it uh, on the Swiss direct investment in Mexico because I somehow felt too young uh, to write on ethics. But when I left UBS, I was asked uh, by a business school actually in Switzerland to give a talk about leadership and ethics. Uh, and I was fascinated about the topic and I took out all my material. Uh, and I just felt uh, there is so little written about the implications of globalization for ethical thinking. And there are libraries on what globalization is and what it means for trade, for politics, for power, for security, for ecology and so on, but there's very little uh, on, uh, on ethics. And at the same time, I mean, we are today, and I think the pandemic is a beautiful example, we are confronted with Confucius, authoritarian type of ethics on one hand, and extreme Tea Party libertarianism in the US, right? And then we have a lot of ethical systems in between. And so one of the key messages in my former book, uh, uh, Inclusive Leadership, is that leaders have to articulate what they stand for in this world. Otherwise, we can leaders can't provide orientation. And so what I would expect uh, leaders to do is a, to reflect on where they stand. And there are different. There's not one size fits all. I happen to be a freedom uh, lover, but a responsible freedom lover, not a libertarian. I, I, I also happen to believe that people who have more freedom, more wealth, more ambition, more capability need to do something with it that they can articulate. Uh, that it helps uh, society. And in my case, it was the philanthropic work, but there can be other ways to do that. But, but doing nothing, just enjoying life and not uh, making everybody else jealous, but not contributing anything is in my book, not ethical. Uh, and so in that sense, I do think leaders have to meet a higher threshold uh, of demonstrating to the world uh, that they that they contribute and and so that's a a real passion of myself uh, that we that we have more ethical but not in a way that right now also we have it that every topic is moralized right that uh, wearing a mask is a political statement that's not what i mean <laughs> what i mean is a, a, a real debate uh, at global levels among among leaders about what are the right models, what are the right values, what are behaviors that are sustainable for the planet and for societies. Yeah, and I and I share a little. I, I also share that view of leadership with Peter, even though we can have political views that are different in in many cases. We share that that I think deep believe that leadership uh, requires an ethical. Uh, engagement, no, and I think for me it was also important to include this in in the book in every chapter, and I like it also from a pedagogical point of view as a professor. Uh, I think a, a lot of the interesting decisions that we put at the end of the chapter are right versus right dilemmas. You know, I think a lot of the key leadership decisions are not right versus wrong because that's a very easy answer. <laughs> you know what to the right, so you have to be. Uh, to decide the wrong thing and to, to violate human rights or to do that purposefully takes a, 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 a certain type of personality. But most of the decision that we make or the businesses make, governments make, individuals make, are more nuanced and are right versus right. And then I think that's why we include at the end and they make a great pedagogical tool. And I think we have that aspiration also of the book, not only to be an interesting book to read as a content, but to be used for teaching that to be used in a classroom setup to 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 get the right debate behind these issues because again and also to be practical so these decisions have practical implications so when you make the decision there are certain trade-offs there are certain courses of action there are certain applications so how do you bring that ethical stance or that ethical point of view into your everyday practice and i think that is what makes a leader different and that's also what we believe at IMD, you know, that the, the kind of transformation that leadership can, can bring forward. You know. Before you started out on this journey of the book and kind of collaborating on it together, was there a, a bigger aha moment or thought process of why you decided to, to work on it together? Um, is there a story behind that at all? Well, the story is that basically at ELEA, when we completed our 10-year anniversary in 2016, 
uh, we kind of went into soul searching. I mean, we were wondering what are we doing here? How successful have we been? Uh, how do the next 10 years look? And I think one of the conclusions out of that exercise is that we are learning such a tremendous amount of insights, of methods, of tools, of data, uh, that it's kind of a shame not to make best use of it and share it with others. And out of this, and obviously because of my link with IMD, uh, we developed this idea of uh, uh, sponsoring a chair, the LA Chair for Social Innovation. Uh, and then we found a uh, privilege to find Vanina, uh, who, who was a perfect fit for us, given her background, given her professional uh, kind of uh, credibility in this field. And so when Vanina and I got together, it was actually one of the first projects that we said, why don't we write the book? Uh, because that will help us as a forcing device to really uh, think uh, what we learned, what we did, tell our story. Uh, it will give her an possibility to uh, have an objective outside in view of what we have done, to have an academic uh, lens to it. And I must say, I give uh, Vanina full credit to the name. I would not have had the courage to call it the Elea way, uh, but Vanina essentially said, no, you need to kind of stand for this with the Elea oh, way. So it was, it was Vanina's uh, contribution, uh, uh, this title. And I think it was just a terrific exercise and it proved, uh, I think, uh, that uh, what, what I said before, that this whole topic is now reaching mainstream. And one of my biggest moments in the past 18 months was this trip we did together to Peru, one week with the executive MBA students uh, of the IMD program. And these, are, these were 32 kind of senior executives across all industries from all types of geographies. And the whole topic during the week was essentially uh, the activities of the, of the ELEA Center and doing LAR cases uh, on due diligence, on investment proposals. And I must say it was for me a real eye-opener. It was also actually one of the reasons why I approached Paul Polman uh, with his quote on convergence, because I felt now we are, we are there, right? The executives uh, basically don't treat the social entrepreneurs as a species somewhere on the side doing interesting things, but not really being taken seriously. I think the executives recognize that this is mainstream. I mean, we need to transform our economies into impact economies in order to serve society. Yeah, from my side, I think, uh, what was also interesting, you can find a lot of books about social entrepreneurship, and then you have a lot of books about impact investing, you know, and at the same, sometimes about research, we like to divide our fields and we have journals where you publish certain things and then others, you know, and I think what I found interesting in, in, in the experience of the ELEA Foundation and the methodology of, of ELEA uh, was this, I, or this idea of this putting both together to look at more holistic or a more system systemic view of how you create impact. That is not just putting money or mobilizing private resources towards certain problems. And it's not only about looking at social entrepreneurs that you need to actually have them together to get innovation uh, and impact. So from, from a research point of view, from a pedagogical point of view, I also like uh, the idea of the book and I thought I could bring also part of the experience from the academic side and from the pedagogy side into a stronger uh, book. So I think we, are, we complemented each other uh, quite well while, while writing and, and from my, so, my side also an absolute respect for the job of Peter and the writing of Peter and also about the work that the LEA Foundation does. So we try to make justice and get some learnings that also can go beyond of what the LEA Foundation does you know, and can inspire others. Does LEA have uh, an acronym? Is there a, a deeper meaning behind that that you can give us? And also, uh, will, will one of you depart the, uh, I know it, but my listeners don't, uh, the ideology, the, the principles of the LEA as well, so. Yeah, Elea was essentially uh, created as a result of a, of a brainstorming that we did uh, when we created it. And my only rule was it cannot be named the Woofley Foundation. A, because my name is just not spellable. Many people make mistakes writing it. But more importantly, uh, there are too many foundations out there 
that serves the glorification of the founder and not uh, the purpose uh, that it was created for. And so uh, we then came up with his name Elea, and Elea is essentially the name of a town that was created by the Greeks uh, in the 8th century BC in southern Italy. It's today called Velia. Uh, it has a pre-Socratic philosopher school. Parmenides was one of the philosophers. And it was for us, in a way, apart from being just a nice sounding name, it was a symbol uh, for globalization, both with its philosophical aspects, but also uh, with its kind of uh, fragility, because uh, Vedia flourished for about three centuries, and I think by the fourth century, it was essentially destroyed, uh, and it was, uh, it was abandoned. So that's, that's the genesis of the name. Thank you very much. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Vanina? No, I think that that's okay. on the. <laughs> so the, the, I think the, the Lea Center comes uh, also with with that aim uh, from the donation of the family of Peter. And again, it's not from the foundation, but it's actually a generous donation from the family. You know, the perfect. Teacher. I really think that um, uh, there the, the, this book. I loved it, and there are so many Thank far. You. You, you're most welcome, and I actually want to ask both of you. To, to give me a signed physical copy the next time we hopefully yeah. we'll see each other in Davos or in Singapore or or somewhere I would love to have that because I always like to to have a physical signed copy and uh, know the the people who wrote it and, and uh, it has a lot of meaning to me but I recommend it to, to all my readers it's a, a, and, and listeners that uh, it is really far-reaching I don't believe that there's just one uh, a specific target group who needs to read this, who this is valuable for. I think it is very diverse and it's for multiple people, even those small, medium enterprises, small hold farmers, the social entrepreneurs at the ground roots. It's important to have some of this, not only the, the, the models, the, the uh, development, the, the ideology and the ethics of, of all of this and that understanding but to see both sides of, of where the money's coming from or where it should come and what kind of, not, a, not only how to be an, a positive impact investor, but the flip side of that, how to choose the right impact investors in your social enterprise or your social business um, to help you get to that next step. Because there, uh, in this arena of impact investing in general or investing period, uh, there can be numerous uh, amounts of wasted time, uh, the wrong people for your, your business, for your project, for what your goals are. And so I really like that, you know, uh, the focus and, uh, you know, throughout, I think it was after a little bit before chapter nine, but also kind of picked up even more the purpose and the reason on, on those things. Um, basically three different um, stages of these models, you know, the candidate creation, the enterprise development, and the potential realization. Um, then going into the purposeful transformational uh, Ella investment themes and, and really giving scale up and, and answering numerous questions for all sides. And so I really like that. But as far as, and it goes throughout, you know, clear to chapter 17 or beyond of uh, this focus of impact investing and kind of the, the full A to Z, so to say, unfolding of the importance of this and how you look at it. And uh, I um, have worked for several foundations and I uh, used to do a lot of impact investing innovations for purpose that solve global grand challenges and, um, gave you know uh, five million dollars a year out to those who needed investments that for innovations that solve global grand challenges and honestly um, the type of experiences that I had with those individuals those startup those entrepreneurs they were beaten down trodden and in this quick pitch and elevator mode and this you know, it, it was just kind of, I hate to use the word bastardized type of a system, but they felt belittled that like they were forcing these quality purposeful projects and these things that had dealt with existence and sustenance or solving global grand challenges that 
they really had to jump through some circus loops to get some monies and investments. And it's almost a demeaning process and to understand and, and vet your investors and those impact investors, as well as the flip side as an impact investor, how do you want to set that up? How do you want to do that? How do you look for the right people? And um, your, your book just goes through and details that navigating the crisis, navigating and developing and answering all those questions is so wonderful. In that respect, is there some contributions that you can each give us around impact investing, your top takeaways and things that you think that are vital for, for those out, the social entrepreneurs out there to know? I, th I think you, you hit the nail exactly on the point with, uh, with your level of how to, how to bring capital and entrepreneurs together. Uh, and I guess for me, the key word here is partnership, uh, that you are, take the time to understand what uh, entrepreneurs are doing, that you respect what they're doing and that you uh, establish a level of trust to work together, where there is not a charitable model where capital givers give out and donate uh, money uh, in order for essentially a bit of gratitude uh, and, and, and self pride, but where there is a, an, an, a level playing field of partnership of mutual respect. Uh, and I think that's uh, incredibly important. And, and I think that has been missing in traditional models, be it uh, the traditional development aid, where you always talk about aid and you talk about donors and you talk about receivers, but it's also missing in, uh, in, in traditional paternalistic foundations uh, where essentially wealthy people donate money uh, to receivers. Uh, uh, and, and I think they're both very asymmetrical models. And I think what we wanted to establish with the book and also based on this ethical grounding of freedom, liberal ethics, is that level of partnership, that level playing field, which I think also points to globalization. I mean, there are not regions in the world that are worth less than others, even though their GDP might be less developed. So that's, for me, one of the very, very key notions that you commend you. You have written it really carefully and read it really carefully. So thank you very much for taking the effort. At the end, uh, you kind of surmise it as well. You, you go beyond thinking in single organization type of levels and, and you use a beautiful term that I love. It, it's aligning ecosystems and it's really this mm -hmm. complexity system. So it's not investors out here, uh, the, the, the social enterprise here and then something else. They're all a part of the organism together, working together for that success. And, and I, I really like how, how you surmise that. Uh, Vanina? In my, yeah, yes. in my case, and, and again, that was a very conscious decision uh, we made, and it obviously reflects the, the layer. But sometimes when you write a book, people ask, OK, what's the target audience? Is this for investors? Is this for entrepreneurs? So having this holistic view, we had to fight it. No, they, they obviously, the editorial understood from the very beginning, and they were very supportive. But but it's not a traditional way of writing a book with a very clear, one-minded, I would say, reader. You no, know? and for me, in uh, from the learnings of the book that you're saying, it also goes to this this holistic view. But also, is start with a problem. No, don't start with the money. So start with the intentionality, be absolute poverty, or or, or another uh, grand challenge that you want to face. And then identify a plausible solution. And again, I lead a center for social innovation on IMD, maybe I'm biased on this, but try to find a solution that is more effective and efficient than the way that we've done it in the past that also is able to scale and, 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 and be sustainable. You know? So, and after you, if you have that, if you have the right, address the right problem and have an innovative solution, money will come. So, but how it will come also be picky and investors will do and choose the right uh, financial tools that will help you scale and build a strong business model because there are different ways that investors can uh, mobilize capital. It was traditionally grants, especially for a sector. Now you can go into loans, into uh, equity, et cetera. So now think that we have the tools, we have the financial tools, we had to innovate and adapt them, but always in terms of the life cycle of the business, in terms of the problem that you want to address and look at them again in a partnership, in a type of a relationship 
that 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 will yield the, the, the better results because probably things will change along the process. What you need at the very beginning might be one thing, but after five years, and if you have a COVID crisis, so building that relationship and being able to adapt in the process, I think is key. I really love that. I, I, I love the fact that you, you're, you're speaking about, you know, the elephant in the room to start with the problems and not with the money. We need this money to do this. Well, let's resolve a problem or fix a problem first. And what I've seen in my years of innovation and dealing with that is that the best social entrepreneurs and innovators out there are ones that one way or the other, they've experienced that problem firsthand. And then they say, hey, how can I make my life better? How can I solve this problem for myself? And those have been, and it's not always the case, but in a big majority, they're those who are really solving the problem for themselves. Uh, one, uh, uh, a big one that I really like was, you know, uh, uh, eyeglasses, you know, the expensive cost yeah. of eyeglasses, $1 eyeglasses and helping hands. And it's really the, the fact that you don't want to have any insurance to, to pay for that. You probably are never gonna be in the insurance system, but then also to get an eye exam, and how do you how do you get glasses? And so that we came up with these one dollar eyeglasses, which was all pivotal around a less than four dollar bending tool, and then some Chinese uh, in the pennies or less than pennies optics uh, of different variabilities that bypassed an entire insurance industry and uh, medical industry to to get children and workers in India and around the world glasses into their hands so that they could work and go to school and and have the basics and so the, there's some wonderful beautiful things out there and I see those as well as the people the social aspect of what you're uh, addressing in the book. I do some research on that and I actually call them life printers. You know, yeah. It's people that solve the problem in their own life and sometimes feel privileged because they were able to solve it for themselves. So they realize that others cannot do that and they're able to mobilize and create a solution that scales and becomes a business. You know, I, I Peter love, knows I, I talked about this for a while. I yeah. love to see that. So I, I have um, four major questions for you. The very first one is going to be probably the worst and hardest that you've, you've had so far. But before I get to those, I want to ask if there's anything that I didn't touch upon that we didn't discuss about the book that you would like to bring to light that, that people are, uh, uh, it would be vital for them to know so that I, we can really, I want to push them out there to go get a copy and to read it and, and apply, it, especially those who are thinking about starting business, those who have a business. Uh, I believe there's some invaluable tools in there. I think it was very comprehensive and, and uh, recommend you for uh, the depth of, of knowledge that you acquired. I mean, just three details and uh, in terms of facts. I think A, IMD is 25 years old, not 75 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was head of, not of UBS hedge fund, but of UBS group. Uh, and, and, and the third is the book appeared in November and not in February. Perfect, perfect. Do you have anything? Anita? No, I'm fine. Okay, so here I'm going to hit you hard with the first question, and I want you oh. both to answer, and I want you to answer it um, from, from your aspect, from your family standpoint, and not in the bigger political sense or for Switzerland or the world. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the square word, although we have all <laughs> been asking it and pulling out our hair this year. It's what's the future? Anina? Um, uh, what's the future? In my case, I have two teenage daughters, Ella and Zoe. Um, they are my concern every day to live a better world or at least marginally better, where I think I'm failing for now, <laughs> just uh, for them. And, and I see them qualitatively different. I see them making decisions in a very different way that I did when, when I was a teenager. Uh, so for me, and I, and I make like, for example, I teach an executive MBA at IMD and they just had a, precisely on these topics, they had to make a presentation. Uh, and in the past, as you, as Peter mentioned, 
I took Peter and other finance people in the panel for their presentations. This time I put a young activist. So I chose six UN incredibly feisty, smart young activists to put in the panel. So I think I think something we learn probably with Greta, but in our own experience with young people is that we need to answer to younger generations and the things that I do for me, I put the face of my daughter there. For me, that's what's at stake and makes it very personal. I know it sounds cheesy, but it's the truth. <laughs> for me, it's continue to stay alert, curious, probing, innovative, flexible, interested, and through that also interesting. And for me, one of the key measurement on whether I stay that is whether young people are still interested to work with me, to listen to me, to learn from me. And uh, that actually also involves my kids. I have three uh, ch children that are grown up as well. They are 32, 29, and 26. But not only, it's also the team at Delea, for example, uh, young, uh, ambitious, terrifically talented people. And I want to convey a glass half full perspective. Uh, I'm always getting frustrated with old people living in uh, wealthy surroundings, being incredibly uh, privileged and, and knowing, doing nothing less than complaining about life and about circumstances. Uh, these are the ones I have very little patience for. That's, that's beautiful. I, um, in case you didn't know, I'm also a, a father of four adult children. I'm actually a grandfather. My fourth grandchild was just born October 14th. Oh, wow. And so I, ha I have Congratulations. Thank you very much. I have a, a beautiful uh, vision of the future that really ties closely to the, my grandchildren, my children, and, and the future of generations. And I have a lot of hope in them. One, one way that I would answer that question, and I believe you both know that I'm a sustainable development goal advocate, speak a lot about the SDGs and ESG advisor as well, um, is that our future is, uh, is, is not uncertain. Uh, uh, there is numerous plans in our world for the future we want to reach. Uh, a lot of us don't know those plans or don't know that vision. Um, and so when we ask ourselves, what's the future? And we don't have an answer. If we don't haven't understood what those global plans or those plans are for us, then we don't have a plan. And usually what happens is the future happens to us. And a lot of, uh, I have a lot of friends who, and, and colleagues that are sort of so-called futurists um, that are dealing a lot with foresight modeling in the future. But, but in reality, we cannot wait for the future to be delivered to us. And what most people misunderstand is that the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a historical precedence. They're the world's first ever global moonshot. 197 countries came together for the first time in history and agreed on the Sustainable Development Goals before the Paris Agreement, September 24th. If you know anything, I will tell you that this is an absolute historical precedence. If you know delegates or politicians or these countries that decided on that, it's hard enough for two of them to decide where they're gonna go to lunch or what they're gonna feed their kids for dinner, let alone 197 decide on a roadmap and plan for the future that is foresight, backcasted with dynamic systems modeling with money, targets and indicators as a roadmap to achieve by 2030. So that is not only a historical precedence, but it's one that many people don't know. If you realize it, if you know about it, you start working towards it, which you guys address in, in, in your book as well, uh, talk about the sustainable development goals. Vanina, you also uh, are, are, are big on this as well. Uh, and Peter, I'm sure you are as well. It is a great roadmap if you don't know, if you don't have the leadership or the guidance in your life to know where's the future going, what we're doing. Here is a super one for the world and it's a historical precedence if we jump on board, I know that we can reach the exponential function just like COVID reached the exponential function to be spread around the world. We can reach critical mass, apply the things and the roadmap into our lives, and we will have a much more resilient, desirable future to live in. 
with that having been said and kind of throwing out my vision, I have three last questions for both of you. And they're kind of selfish. They're for my listeners. They're takeaways for them that they could apply into their lives and to their businesses that would help them. If you had a, a sustainable takeaway to depart, words of wisdom, uh, one message for my listeners, what would it be, your message? In my case, um, is that, again, it's not about money. It's not only about financing. Uh, it's about who you are. Uh, so, and, and you were talking about these lifepreneurs, you know, think about what kind of assets you have, what kind of skills, capabilities, and can, how can you put that into practice? and how you can collaborate with others that bring different things to the table, but always have it, it, and a bias towards action. So choose intentionally your purpose, the problem you want, and bring who you are into the table, the things that you have, your life experience, your skills, your education, even your money, it is a money case to solve a problem. But I always ask my, when I ask MBA students or somebody to do a project, I always ask, why you? You know, why you can solve these problems, why you can pull this off, you know. I would say be inclusive, uh, be open, curious, look beyond your own job, your own family, uh, look at uh, across boundaries, uh, be it geography boundaries, cultural boundaries, time boundaries, uh, uh, kind of uh, sector boundaries and, and build bridges. Uh, don't put up walls, uh, don't create divisions, uh, create connections in order to make uh, globalization work. Uh, that would be my key message. Thank you. What should young innovators, um, philanthropists, um, young social entrepreneurs, those who want to study economics, those who are in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact? Um, I don't know if you want to start, Peter, or... Yeah, maybe uh, we, we have one uh, chapter here is that we love plans. Uh, and we uh, actually do feel uh, that planning uh, is a, a really important thing for innovators uh, to, to be sit down and write down uh, what you want to do, what you want to achieve. Uh, and I know sometimes this is not a very popular thing because obviously uh, in our turbulent world today, the plan may be obsolete already in two weeks. Uh, but in my experience, uh, also working with entrepreneurs, those who regularly sit down, think ahead, reflect on what they want to achieve, uh, I think are just better off and are better able to articulate their views, their, their, their vision, uh, and then also obviously attract following, uh, including their own team, but also capital providers. In, in my case, I, I, I agree with Peter, but also I, what I would say is uh, keep that action bias alive, you know? uh, do things, pilot and pivot and change because we need speed. It's not <laughs> we're enough uh, at the speed we're changing. So keep pushing the, the boundaries. And, and I'm seeing again, uh, as Peter was talking about inclusiveness and we can talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, bring a different lens and a different view. So don't be afraid of, of telling because you're young or of having a voice. Uh, and I think I, I truly believe in agency of young people and we all older generations not be paternalizing and, and listening you know, and, and have a voice at the table. So, and that's what I tried to give a space for that too. Yeah. The last question I have for you both is really what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? In my case, it's just you getting a little personal here, but it was that my that my passion was an asset and it counted. You know, as a female, many times you try to tame your passion. I know it doesn't show Peter, <laughs> but I think many times I thought I had to comply to certain rules and and I'm Latin too, so, but I, 
what I own, I think, as I'm getting older, is that the passion that I put in the things that drive my actions and my learning and my research uh, can be an asset, and that is part of who I am and uh, and and the, the pioneering that I try to bring at the table. Yeah. For me, it's empathy and patience. Uh, I guess I, I was a pretty aggressive young executive. Uh, conforming in, in quite a lot of ways, a typical uh, McKinsey consultant profile. Uh, and uh, I think I obviously learned uh, on the way how complicated human beings are and how important it is uh, to understand uh, what they are driven with. And that uh, when you speak louder, it usually does not change a lot of things. But what really helps is to actually listen to them and try to understand and see that when they have a different view from your own, it's not because they are stupid or they are mean, uh, but because they just have a different perspective and that it helps to understand that perspective. Thank you both so much. It's been a sheer pleasure. We could actually talk for hours because not only is the book over 200 pages long, uh, and, but your research, your time that you've put into this wonderful work and into the foundation and to the center uh, is, is valuable for the amount of time, but we could just have so many bridges or so many rabbit holes we could go down to. But I wanna thank you both for your time and I hope we can do a follow-up. And, and I'm, I was serious about the book. I want your signature and both a nice little thanks for the podcast or something. I, I want to see you guys in person and follow up again in the future on your progress and, and how things are going. And I really tell them, all my listeners, please go out there, get the book, uh, read it. it it's a, a treasure trove of knowledge and wisdom that we all need to go, uh, to be on the right side of history, to move forward in the right direction and to get some tools and skills that we all need uh, around these important topics for the future. Thank you both. And, and I would like yeah, to well, thank, thank you. you for making the effort to reading the book. We, we know from writing that it's not easy to read it. <laughs> and I just want to make sure that you, everybody understands if you buy the book, you actually donate to Elea because Vanina and I yeah. have both uh, said that uh, we will not take any, any personal gains from it. And so it's essentially uh, you contribute to Elea. That's beautiful. Yeah, good. Thank you, Mark. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.